How's everybody doing? I told you I was going to do a special about beer and Bavaria. So I figured I better get, you know, into character, so to speak. First thing I want to say is, Nick, this first one is going to be for you, my friend. Beer I'm drinking right here, this is Augustiner. Augustiner is the oldest continuously ran brewery in the city of Munich. They opened their doors in, no joke, 1328. Is that right? I don't know. I've already had like one or two beers. But in any case, August turns to all this kitchen that you ran brewery in the city of Munich. It's actually the reason the city of Munich exists. You have to understand Munich. The word Munich, it means monk. It goes to the original uh, pronunciation of the word, which is München. And München just simply means the word monk. And it's a city built around a monastery. It was built by Henry. Delova, Henry the Lion, well, he was the last Velfin king to rule these lands before the Wittelsbach family took over. And he built this wall and he invited these Augustiner monks to come and live inside his city wall. And Augustiner is still one of the proudest heritage heritages of the city of Munich. This brewery here, they do not advertise because they don't have to. And they do not export because they don't have to. What they do export is called export, and it's horrible, and they know it, and they don't care. You know why? Because this right here is gold in Bavaria. It is literally gold in Bavaria. So, to my friend Nick, I miss you, brother. I wish you were here to come and yell at cars with me to slow down. This is going to be what's called a Hellas. A Hellas is what we, in America, call a lager. Now, lager, though, that doesn't mean beer. The word lager means to store something on a shelf. It literally goes to the history of beer. See, before mechanical refrigeration and heat exchangers and modern-day pasteurization, you couldn't store beer during the summer months. You couldn't, well, that's not true. Let me rephrase this. You couldn't brew beer during the summer months. The reason being is you, well, first, um, if, you, if you know anything about brewing beer, you know, the first thing you have to do after you, of course, uh, you you get your, your malts, you basically grind them up, you mix them with water, you heat them up to release the malt sugar, then you're going to add a little bit of uh, hops during a boiling step to condense it. But when you add the hops and you boil that liquid, which is called wort, it's hot. You then need to cool it very quickly before you add yeast. Um, the yeast is, of course, going to give you the alcohol. And so you have to be able to cool it. Well, before mechanical refrigeration... How did you cool it? Well, you would take that wart and you put it outside in the winter months. And the cold air will basically cool down the wart quickly enough so that you could then basically add your yeast at a perfect temperature. And that yeast would aggressively attack the malt sugar. And then you'd have eventually alcohol. And that's the foundations of beer. Well, without mechanical refrigeration in the city of Munich, they stole the recipe for the Pilsner beer, which is actually made by... a Bavarian brewer up in uh, Prague and they stole the recipe and they tweaked it and they made this beer. <clears throat> this is their lager which is a beer that has a it's uh, basically brewed with a pale malt it's got a low malt sugar content and um, famously could be stored for long periods of time so what they would do is brew all this beer in the month of March in the month of March it was still cold so they brew the beer in March, and during the second fermentation, they put it into wooden barrels. They'd seal the wooden barrels, which would, of course, bind that uh, carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of um, that yeast attacking that malt sugar of fermentation. That's the word I'm looking for. And what would happen is that would give you the carbonation. And they would take those big barrels, and they put them underground. They dig a big hole in the ground, and that's the birth of a, a lager. You see, the word lager in German, it doesn't mean basically beer. It means to store something on a shelf. It goes to the word lagerraum, which is like a pantry or a warehouse. It's a place to put stuff. And so to lager is to put something on a shelf and store it. And that's what they would do. They'd brew this beer in the month of March. And then they would put it into barrels during the second fermentation to get the carbonation to bind with the beer itself put it underground, then bring it up throughout the summer months as they needed it. Now, what's really fascinating to me, especially if you ever go to the city of Munich, 
is what ends up happening next is they would start planting these trees above the actual lager rooms that were underground. And these trees, they had huge leaves and they had a shallow root system. They were horse nut trees and they created a great shady place in the city of Munich. And so the locals, what did they do? They would go and have picnics underneath the trees. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the birth of a beer garden. So I'm drinking my Augustiner beer out of a Max Broy glass. Max Broy is currently, in my opinion, the best brewery in all of Bavaria. Max Broy is a small microbrewery in the city of Oberammergau. So I'm giving a shout out to Susan Stanky. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. And this is one of the best beers. It is the best beer right now. I wish I had Max Broy beer inside a Max Broy glass. But sadly, because of the quarantine, I can't get up there. <laughs> But it is an incredible beer brewed by a man by the name of Chris, who is a master brewer who learned how to study beer at, uh, learned how to brew beer at the Etal Monastery. Well, here's my first step. Here's to and to hoping and praying that the Oktoberfest doesn't get canceled this year. Now, the clothes. Everybody wants to know about Trachten. It's not costume. You have to understand the Bavarians, Bavaria being southern Germany, they wear this all the time. They wear it for weddings. They wear it for funerals. They wear it to go to mass. They wear it to go out to have dinner. And, of course, they're going to wear it to their beer festivals. And the beer festival season, it begin, begins normally with the Spring Fest in Munich, which would be <laughs> in a couple of days. No, in a couple of weeks. But in any case, once the Spring Fest begins in Munich at the Theresienwiese. Visa, then there is a beer festival somewhere in Bavaria all the way until the Oktoberfest. See, beer festivals were a way to get the farmers to leave the fields, come down into the villages, into the valleys. Excuse me, I got a burp. And then they would drink a couple of beers and then hopefully, you know, meet a nice pretty girl and go home and make some babies. It was all about procreation. It goes back to the Thirty Years' War. 1648, everybody was dead. And so they did all these things to try and bring back the population, to bring people out to bring these farmers and get them to meet people that weren't their first cousin. Yeah, I said that. And so basically, they would bring them to these big parties, these big tents, because the weather was always bad here in Bavaria, as you can see today. And what they would do is they would have these big parties, they would drink beer, and they would wear what they would normally wear. Say lederhosen, which are the pants. See, lederhosen, they're just made out of leather. Now, of course, today they're going to be made out of leather that's coming from a wild mountain goat or from um, deer or, from, you know, anything, basically. And you do find the cow leather and then you get the stuff from India, which is made out of some sort of a plastic tree. But in any case, real lederhosen, it just simply means leather pants. Now, the style of clothing, the hats and all this kind of stuff really becomes popular after basically the political revolutions in the middle of the 1800s. Middle of the 1800s, you had these political revolutions that occurred because of Karl Marx, basically. And, well, let's, let's back up. 1846 was the peasants. 1846, the peasants, they rose up and they decided they wanted to give a vo have a voice within the government itself. And so, 1846, you still had kings and queens who ruled most of Europe. And so, what do you do when the peasants rise up? You kill them. <laughs> and that's what happened. But after 1846, Karl Marx, he saw this. He witnessed this, and he witnessed this political strife and decided he needed to give a voice to the peasants. And so he wrote his very famous manifesto with many, many other great writings. And then the college kids, they decided they were going to be the voice. They were going to be the voice. They were going to be the voice to give representation to the peasants. And that occurred throughout college campuses all over Europe, middle of the 1800s, 1854, 1856. And it happened in Munich. At the time, our king, he was called Ludwig I. And at some point, I'm sure I will talk about him in great detail because he was my favorite of the Wittelsbach kings of the 1800s. And Ludwig I, he uh, didn't know what to do. And he eventually gave, gave power to his mistress, a woman by the name of Lola Montez. And um, that was stupid. And then he eventually lost all political power. He got kicked out of power. And his son, Maximilian II, was forced onto the throne. Hold on, I need another sip of beer. That's so good. And when he did this, Maximum II jumps onto the throne. He realizes he's got a he's got a pickle. He's got these young kids rising up against him, and they're college kids, which means 
He can't kill them. They're the kids of the rich. And so he needs to find a way to give representation to the peasants, but still keep his throne. So the first thing he did, he put on the clothing of the peasant. The king began to wear lederhosen, to show his solidarity to the common man. It was a very smart move. Between he and his son, Ludwig II, they began to start these clubs that today are called Trochten Clubs. And this formal wear is called Trocht in male, Trochten in female. And basically, Trocht, it's not just the clothing, but it's the history of Bavaria. Woo, good, good beer. History of Bavaria, and it's the history of their culture, the history of their farming ways. And we would associate it to be like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts in America. Basically, the kids, they come together and they start wearing this stuff for formal events. And then they have these um, club meetings where the girls and the boys will get together and they learn the history of the clothing. They learn the history of their town. They learn the history of farming. And it's something that, in my opinion, we don't have in America. Like 4-H was pretty cool, but it's not anything close to what Trocton is. Because it's not just the history of your area, the history of your culture, the history of your people, but it's the clothing itself. Now, real quick, I got to do a quick shout out to a friend of mine, and he'll know exactly who he is. There it is right there. Now, everybody asks about the pins on the hat and what the feather on the hat. Well, the feather just says I like to hike, and one day I found a feather and I put it in my hat. Uh, the Edelweiss on the front, yes, Edelweiss is, you know, one of our favorite flowers. Great history there. It goes back to the soldiers that were part of the Gebirg's Jaeger Corps. They would uh, hike up to the mountains, and Edelweiss only grows in an altitude of 800 meters or higher, the real Edelweiss. They would find the flower in the nooks and the crannies within the mountains itself, pick it, and since it's a cold weather, rocky flower, it's very dry. And so you could basically put it in your hat, put it in your lapel, and uh, a lot of the soldiers, it was a sign that they were a true mountain soldier. Now, sadly, a lot of those soldiers that trained in Garmisch, Partenkirchen, Middenwald, Murnau, Oberammergau, the Gebirgs Jäger, that special division of the SS, most of them died either... Uh, in Poland or went on to die actually in Russia in Stalingrad and uh, they would wear that flower and so it became the responsibility of their friends to send the flower back home to mom and dad to let them know that they had passed away in battle today though it's just a symbol of Bavaria and then the hat pins everybody has their own distinction of hat pins and why they actually have their hat pins Mine, yeah, I'm a little bit crazy. So you got, of course, the fish because I'm actually part of a fisherferei here in Bavaria, so I can actually legally fish. If you guys are interested in that, it's quite a story. Fishing and hunting is heavily regulated here. This is going to be the pin for the Spring Fest. This is going to be the pin for the Hippodrome, for the Frühlingsfest, one of my favorite beer festivals. Down here, this is the pin for Schottenheimel. Schottenheimel <laughs> brings a tear to my eye. Hold on a second. I got this. Schadenheimel is the oldest tin at the Oktoberfest, and I pray it'll be open this year. Schadenheimel, of course, this is where Albert Einstein used to change the light bulbs as a kid. Isn't that crazy? Uh, sorry, my wife is intervening. But Schadenheimel is a heck of a cool tin, and it used to be actually a brewery. Uh, the brewery closed, and today they still keep their Oktoberfest tent, and this is where the mayor taps the keg to start the Oktoberfest. Above this is going to be Zeppelin, the man, the myth, the legend, the guy who actually created the first Zeppelin. I just thought that was really cool. I went to the museum like twice. It's out of Bowdoin, say. And then this up here is a commemorative pin to honor the Oktoberfest itself. You see, the Oktoberfest began with a wedding. It was the wedding of Ludwig I, my favorite king, the guy I talked about earlier, uh, to his wife, Theresia Saxon von Hildenbergenhausen. The two of them got married on October 12, 1810, and that is the foundations of the Oktoberfest. It's a great story. It's a long story, and it requires more than one beer. So maybe I'll tell you guys another day. The other pin, let's see. We've got up front another commemorative pin. In fact, that is Ludwig I with his wife, Theresia Saxon von Heldenbergenhausen. And the one above, a lot of people will recognize that. That's Tabasco. And those of you out there who know me know that I am from South Louisiana. I am originally from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I went to school just outside of New Iberia where Tabasco is made, and I know a lot of the McElhaney family, and they're great people. I hate Tabasco, the sauce itself, but I love the land. I love the, the name brand. I love the people, everything involving that. And then let's see, last but not least, she's kind of hidden up here, is my little koala bear. Here's my little koala bear. That's actually in honor of a dear friend of mine who I'm currently fighting with. 
guy by the name of Peter Sullivan, who is still dear to my heart. And so I keep a koala bear to honor him from Australia and all the other friends I have from Australia. Well, back to beer before I leave. Last but not least, let's talk one last minute about Augustiner. 1328. Isn't that crazy? This beer is incredible too. They do not advertise because they don't have to. You cannot get it anywhere else other than Bavaria because they don't want to. And the entire brewery, because of secularism, you guys know what secularism is? Okay. Well, secularism is when Napoleon, that little man with the complex, showed up here in Bavaria. He basically brought his laws and he says, okay, Catholic Church, I love you guys, but here's the deal. You guys mm -mm, can't make no money. You should be taking care of people's souls and not their pocketbooks. And so he took away the industry of the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic monks, the Augustiner monks, they lost their brewery. And that happened to a lot of breweries around here. And so famously, Augustiner, the brewery, was purchased by the Josef Wagner family. That's what the JW is on the label. I don't know if it's on this part, but it's usually somewhere on there. Oh. Oh, somewhere on there. And... Augustiner was purchased by the Josef Wagner family, and then in 1976, the Josef Wagner family, for tax purposes, took 49% of their brewery. I love this part. And they sold it to charity for one Deutschmark. One Deutschmark. They sold 49% of the owning interest of their brewery to children's charities in the city of Munich. And so the reason I drink this beer so often, it's really good, don't get me wrong. But also, when I drink it, I'm giving money to kids. Isn't that great? <sighs> Sometimes it's good to be an alcoholic. I'm joking, of course. Well, guys, that's it for today. I, I really think I might keep this up. You know, the beer part. There's nothing else to do. So that's it for now. Talk to you guys later. If you have any questions, emails, of course, you can email me, put me uh, some notes, whatever. You want to know more about the history of beer? I mean, beer has been around since mankind, basically since we settled down in the old Fertile Crescent and started, you know, producing crops. Um, what do you do with the old crops, the old bread? Well, you break them apart, put them in the water, boil it for a little while or heat it up for a little bit, get that malt sugar, naturally occurring yeast in the air would begin to ferment it, and then you got alcohol. And that's the foundations of beer. One last detail. But I mean, as you guys probably, those people that I'm watching right now that know me know, um, I know a lot about beer. And so I can do this a lot. So we'll probably do this about once a week. That's how much I drink these days. Um, with that said, though, one last thing. The reason Bavaria, where I live, uh, claims to be the home of beer. It's not because I created beer. Um, it is because of hops. See this right around there? All these little um, awards that they have won. And then that right there, that's hops. See, when you talk about beer, the foundations of beer, it is water, malt, which is going to be any grain that you begin to throw into water. It begins to germinate, and then you dry it, and you roast it, and you grind it up, and you heat it up. And the third ingredient hops you see bavaria in 867 was the first place that we know in history to actually add hops to beer that's why they claim beer well guys that's all for today talk to you next time bye bye